Hi, boys and girls. I'm Miss Gerald. Welcome to today's Read Aloud. Today, I'm going to be reading chapter 20 and 21 of our book, Bat and the Waiting Game. Chapter 20 starts with pot growing. The sleepover ended at noon the next day when the last of Janie's friends was picked up by her mother. See you, Bat, said Frida. Thank you, Janie. Thank you, Dr. Tam. The first kid to leave had been Israel. His parents had to pick him up early because they were taking a load of Cora's pottery to the farmer's market to sell, which they did every few months, and Israel had to help. It was fun, he had said to Bat before he left, but Bat couldn't tell if that was the truth or not. Bat was still embarrassed about how he had yelled at Israel the night before, but he didn't like to apologize. And anyway, Israel shouldn't have kept pushing him about when they would have to release Thor into the wild. And the next day, a dreary drizzle sort of day, Israel didn't come to school. Maybe he's sick, Mom said. There's a cold going around. She called Israel's house to find out, and sure enough, she found out that Israel had been under the weather. That's a funny expression, Bat said. His voice felt sort of high and tight, because you can't really be under the weather or over the weather. You can only be in the weather or out of the weather. Don't you think? I think, Mom said resting one gentle hand on Bat's shoulder, that maybe you're still upset about fighting with Israel this weekend. Do you want to talk about it? I want to know what the weather will be like for the rest of the week, Bat said, rolling up onto the balls of his feet. You want to know whether the weather will be warm, Mom said, squeezing Bat's shoulder. Yes, said Bat, glad that Mom wasn't going to make him talk about Israel. Israel was back in school the next day, but he told Bat he didn't feel well enough to do anything together when they got back to his house. He disappeared into his bedroom, leaving Bat in the kitchen with Tom. I've got an idea, Tom said. How about we get our hands dirty? Bat was not a big fan of dirty hands. He didn't feel like saying no to Tom, so he followed him out the back door, across the yard, under a sky dappled with gray clouds, and into Cora's shed. Cora was there, wrapping a vase in a thick swaddle of newspaper. This one is on its way to Vermont, she told them. I just sold it. Great, said Tom. Then, want to introduce Bat to the joys of pot throwing? For a minute, Bat imagined the three of them picking up the pots from their sleeves and throwing them against the walls, hearing them shatter in his imagination. Cora must have seen the concern on his face because she quickly said, throwing a pot is just another way of saying making a pot on the wheel. It's fun, even if it's sort of sticky and slimy. Do you want to try? Actually, Bat would have preferred to go home or to go to mom's vet clinic or even to go back to Mrs. Grayson's classroom. Sorry, Mr. Grayson's classroom. But he couldn't go any of those places, not right now. He had to wait, so he sat down at the potter's wheel. Okay, he said. Outstanding, said Tom. First, the clay. First, the clay. Cora repeated, and she brought out a large plastic wrapped cube of clay from under the counter. She peeled back the plastic and picked up a piece of wire with a wooden handle attached to the end. She held the wire against the cube and pulled it through, shaving off a layer of clay. She set it aside and rewrapped the cube in plastic. Then she held out the clay to back. Squish it into a ball, she said, squeezing it hard to get it out all the air bubbles. Bat hesitated, but finally he held out his hand and let Cora place the clay into it. It was cool, almost cold, and damp. He folded it in his hands and squeezed, forming it into a rough ball. His hands turned to a dusty gray that dried to white. He squeezed and squeezed. Great, said Tom. Now slam it down hard. Just throw it down right there on the wheel. Bat did. Whack! went the clay against the wheel, flattening out in a satisfying way. Again, said Cora. So Bat picked up the clay and reformed it into the ball and he threw it a second time. Tom took a turn throwing and shaping it and then Cora pronounced it ready. Okay, said Cora, throw it one more time and this time try to aim right for the center of the wheel. Bat threw the clay. Perfect, Cora said. Now Tom will keep the wheel spinning so you don't have to worry about that. I'll help you keep the clay wet. You just cup your hands around the clay, gently but firmly, like you're holding on to something precious, okay? I'll pretend I'm holding Thor, Bat said, my skunk, Kit. 
great idea, Cora said. Ready? Bat nodded. He cupped his hands around the clay. Beside him, Tom stepped gently on the foot pedal and the wheel began to spin. Cora took a cup of water and poured it in a slow, steady stream over Bat's hands and onto the clay. Good, Cora said. Push the clay down and in, down and in. Don't worry if it squishes through your fingers, that's fine. Wet clay oozed out between each of Bat's fingers and it was a gooey feeling, but not bad. Kind of interesting, actually. Bat watched the clay spinning, spinning in fast little circles. He watched the clay pushing out between his fingers. He felt almost hypnotized by the sensation of the slippery wet clay in his hands. Spinning and spinning, the challenge of holding it just right in between his fingers and thumbs, not too loosely or it would wobble out of control, not too tightly or the emerging bowl would smash, smoosh on the side. But then he could feel the clay beginning to shift off center. It was falling to the side and he tried to push it back into the center of the wheel, but it seemed like the harder he pushed, the worse it got. And then the clay wasn't a ball anymore. It was a weird floppy tube and it wasn't twisting and falling. And then he yelled, it's breaking! And flicks of clay splattered his face. Tom took his foot off the pedal and the wheel slowed and then stopped. You did it, he said, grinning. No, I didn't, Bat said. I made a mess. Mess is the beginning of art, Cora said. She was smiling too. Do you want to try again? Yes, Bat said. Yes, please. Before Bat went home, he peeked his head into Israel's room, hoping to tell Israel about how he had learned to make a bowl about how it wasn't perfectly symmetrical, but it was still recognizable as a bowl, and how Cora had called it cre creatively, creatively catawampus. Maybe he could even say something to let Israel know that he felt bad about their fight. But Israel was in his bed, his covers pulled up over his chin, his eyes closed, working with the potter's wheel had made Bat feel so good, and he really wanted to tell Israel all about it. He almost went over to Israel's bed to see if he was really asleep or just resting. But then Tom called, Bat, your mom's here. Bat hesitated, looking at the sweaty curls on Israel's forehead. Then quietly, he backed out of Israel's room, feeling sort of lonely and disappointed that he wouldn't be able to say goodbye. Hmm. Chapter 21, Scene Stealer. At last, Janie's opening night arrived. Bat felt that it arrived at last because it seemed like he had been hearing Janie talk about it forever. In just a few hours, he wouldn't have to hear about how excited Janie was or how nervous Janie was anymore. We're leaving in five minutes, Bat, Mom called from the kitchen. She had already dropped Janie off at the school so that she could get ready. I get to wear a hoop skirt and makeup and fake eyelashes, Janie had boasted before she left for the show. That all sounded perfectly terrible to Bat. Clothes should be easy to wear and comfortable, like t-shirts and pants with elastic waist. And the thought of anyone gluing anything to their eyelids made Bat positively twitchy. Bat looked around his room. He didn't want to go to Janie's play. In the last few weeks, he'd spent so much more time away from home than he was used to that another night out sounded just awful. And there was this little Thor in his playpen. Finished with his dinner and looking up at Bat expectantly. Every night after dinner, Bat had been taking Thor out and working on training him to come and stay. They were still working on stay. Oh, little Thor, Bat said to the kit, you look lonely in there. Bat felt lonely too. Even though he was about to go to a theater filled with people, sometimes that was when Bat felt the loneliest of all in a crowd. Without really thinking about it, Bat slung Thor's sling around his neck and scooped up the kit, nesting him in place. This time, it was a really tight fit to get Thor into the sling. Bat would have to ask Lawrence to make him a bigger one. He grabbed his jacket and put it on over the sling, zipping it all the way up to the top. Just settle down and take a nap, Bat whispered, and you can come with me to the show. When Bat came into the kitchen, Mom said, are you sure you want to wear your jacket? It's a lovely night. I'm sure I want to wear my jacket, Bat answered. Outside of the theater, Bat saw lots of people who had come to see Janie in her play. 
There was Dad. Hey, sport. Hi, Valerie, he said to Bat and Bat's mom. There was Lawrence. Bat boy, Dr. Tam, he said. Bat had never seen Lawrence wearing regular clothes. He always saw Lawrence at the clinic, where Lawrence wore blue scrubs. Tonight, Lawrence was wearing a shirt with buttons and a collar under a sports coat, and his shoes looked like they were made of leather instead of rubber. You look different, Bat told Lawrence. Lawrence laughed, his same laugh, even from inside the different clothes, and that made him seem more like Lawrence again. There was Ezra and his parents, and there was Israel with his mom and dad. Israel waved at Bat, and Bat waved back, but he felt kind of shy about it. On Thursday, Israel had been all better from his cold, but things still weren't the same between them. They'd shared an awkward snack at Israel's kitchen table before Tom had taken them over to Bat's house to water the skunk garden, and Mom had gotten home early from the clinic. Finally, it was time to go into Janie's school auditorium, where folding chairs were arranged in rows facing the stage. Bat, his mom, Lawrence, and his dad all scooted down a row, not too close to the front, but not way in the back either, and waited for the show to start. Bat, baby, do you want to take off your jacket? Mom whispered as the lights were going dark. Bat slid the zipper down a little, but then shook his head. No, he felt Thor rustle around and then settled back down. And then the music started and the curtains opened and the kids started singing and dancing. It took a minute, but then Bat recognized Maggie. She looked different in her Alice costume, a blue dress with a white apron, white tights, and flat black shoes. She looked older than she looked at the sleepover when she'd been wearing those tiger-footed pajamas. But when Janie came on stage dressed as the queen with a red hoop dress, a giant red crown, and eyelashes that Bat could see from the auditorium, audience, he didn't recognize her at all until mom leaned over and whispered, look, it's your sister. Even then, Bat didn't totally believe that it could be Janie. She looked taller than she looked in regular life, and she moved across the stage like she really was the queen of something. When she opened her mouth to sing her solo, Bat's mouth opened, too, in surprise. It was Janie! That was the same song she'd been practicing all month amplified by the microphone she wore taped to her cheek, supported by the music that played along with her, backed up by all the other performers as they danced behind her. She's amazing, Bat whispered. Janie's song was so strong and loud and wonderful that Bat leaned forward in his seat. He had no idea that Janie could be so wonderful. He had no idea that she was so talented and brave. He had no idea that Skunk! yelled a voice in the dark, high-pitched and loud. Skunk! yelled a voice in the dark, and then another, until the auditorium rattled with yells. And then it was filled with something worse, the sharp, acidic stink of Skunk's first spray. Chairs turned over as the audience rushed towards the exits. Bat panicked his eyes stinging from the odor, dropped to the ground and felt around desperately for Thor. Oh, what a mistake it had been to bring the kid. Thor, he cried into the dark. Beside him, his mom called, Thor! And then Bat heard Dad's voice, Thor and Lawrence, Thor! Someone turned the lights on and Bat swiped and spied a black and white tail two rows up, sticking out from behind an overturned chair. Quick as he could, Bad scuttled over on his hands and knees and scooped the kid into his arms, cradling him close. Bat blinked against the sudden light. He looked up, and there on stage, armed, crossed, crown leaning to one side, stood Janie. Oh, no. His sister is not happy. How do you think she's feeling right now? How do you think Bat's feeling? And what about poor Thor? Oh. Well, next time you'll read chapter 22, No Tomato Juice. Hmm, why do you think they need tomato juice? Do you know? All right, friends, I hope you enjoyed these two chapters. I enjoyed ending my day with you. Have a wonderful afternoon, learn a lot, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye, friends.